Welcome to Stick to Sports. I'm Zach Malamud. And I'm Joey Polatsky. Today, the Bills score six points in Jacksonville. The Broncos shock America's team, and Purdue takes down Michigan State. Roll it. The Jacksonville Jaguars upset the Buffalo Bills with a 9-6 win in Jacksonville on Sunday. Bills quarterback Josh Allen completed 31 of his 47 passes for 264 yards and two interceptions. On the other side for Jacksonville, their defense sacked Josh Allen four times and forced three turnovers out of this Buffalo offense. Joey, should we start worrying about the Buffalo Bills? No, Zach, we shouldn't worry about the Bills whatsoever. It's the AFC, keep that in mind. The AFC far inferior to the NFC. It was one uncharacteristic game. The Bills defense did a great job. They held the Jacksonville Jaguars to just 218 yards, but the Bills still need a running back. Josh Allen wasn't great yesterday, but this is such a one-faceted offensive team. But Josh Allen knows they played poorly. It was one letdown game. It's not the end of the world. They're going to play the Jets next week. The Jets beat good teams, so we'll see, but I wouldn't worry about the Buffalo Bills at all. I can see what you're saying. I'm a little bit worried. They're still my pick out of the AFC and definitely out of the AFC East, but they need to have a better game plan on offense. They ran the ball nine times yesterday. They rely so heavily on Josh Allen, and they should. He's an MVP caliber player every single year. But what happens when he's not playing as well as he should be in a game? Credit to Jacksonville. They had a great game plan on defense to shut down that quarterback, but we expect more from Buffalo and they know they need to be better, especially if they want to advance far in the playoffs. The Denver Broncos defeated the Dallas Cowboys 30-16 to down in the Lone Star State Sunday afternoon. Denver's defense was outstanding, holding Dallas to 290 total yards and keeping the Cowboys off the scoreboard until late in the fourth quarter. Zach, every team in the AFC West now holds a four-win record. Do you think the Broncos even have a chance at winning this division? They definitely do. I think a lot of their offense needs to come in the run game, though. Going into this year, everyone expected Melvin Gordon to be the starting running back and Javante Williams to take over midway through the season. But we haven't seen that, and Denver looks really good with the committee in the backfield. The Raiders lost to the Giants yesterday, and Kansas City has a really tough end-of-season schedule. So it's between Denver and the Chargers, and they haven't played each other yet this season. So two games against the Chargers, with both of those still on the calendar, Denver still has a shot in the AFC West. Yeah, I think somehow, some way, the Denver Broncos do indeed have a chance at winning this division. If you told me before the season the Broncos would have a chance at having a better record than the Kansas City Chiefs, I would have told you you're out of your mind. But somehow, some way, they're still there. Teddy Bridgewater is now 19-3 and against the spread as a road underdog. Keep that in mind going forward. You'll get into that later as well. But Teddy Bridgewater is amazing as a road underdog. The Broncos play their best when doubted. The AFC West is wide open, and they just might be there come the postseason. No doubt. The Tennessee Titans moved to 7-2 and two after a dominant defensive performance against the Los Angeles Rams on Sunday. Matthew Stafford was picked off twice in this game with Kevin Bayard taking one to the house midway through the second quarter. Joey, most people counted out Tennessee when Derrick Henry went down. Where did the Titans rank in the AFC? Personally, I have the Titans as the fourth best team in the AFC. I have Bills, Ravens, Browns, Titans as my four. I would, I would have the Titans as two if Derrick Henry was still there, but obviously with the best running back in the NFL being out, it's going to knock you down. Somehow, the, the Titans were able to beat the Los Angeles Rams last night. They were carried by the defense. Stafford threw two really bad interceptions, and he went into halftime, regrouped. I thought the Rams were going to have a chance when Stafford had a chance to catch his breath and regain himself. They did have a chance, but... The defense was really good last night against one of the best offenses in the league. The pick six and the interception on the 10-yard line just rattled Stafford. It was really clear, but it was a shocking result, and the defense stepped up without Derrick Henry playing in the game. Yeah, no, not, no doubt. I think they're number three with Henry's injury. I still have the Bills ahead of the Titans, even though the Titans beat them in week six. And I also have the Ravens ahead of them, just based on how good Lamar Jackson has been this season. But the Titans' weakness the last couple of years has been their defense. And to step up like they did against Matthew Stafford and that Rams offense was unbelievable to watch. 
The Cincinnati Bengals have now dropped back-to-back -back games for the first time this season after a 41-16 loss to the Cleveland Browns yesterday. Baker Mayfield posted an 82.7 QBR while Nick Chubb went for 137 yards. Zach, is this more of a significant win for the Browns or a concern for the Bengals? I think this is way more significant for the Browns, a team that made it to the AFC Divisional Round last year who have been below expectations so far. All the drama in midweek with Odell Beckham Jr. getting released, Baker Mayfield looked okay yesterday. And the defense dominated, forcing three turnovers against Joe Burrow and a Bengals offense that has been really good so far this season. Nobody expected the Bengals to be in the playoffs. A lot of people expected the Browns to be there. So the Browns winning in Cincinnati is a huge win for Cleveland. Yeah, I think there's going to be a great division coming down the line. But this was a huge win for the Browns. The Cleveland Browns got that swagger back yesterday. Baker no longer has to worry about finding Odell, whether Odell fans think he wasn't finding him enough and whatever it was, it definitely it was in the back of Baker's head, whether he wasn't throwing it to him enough or Baker thought he was going to try to throw too much, whatever it may be. But also, the, the Cleveland Browns are finding out how to use Baker Mayfield with this left toward labrum. He was in the pocket a good amount yesterday, but he was still efficient, and the running game with Nick Chubb yesterday was really good. We're going to take a quick break here on Stick to Sports. Up next, we take a look at the NBA season so far and check in on the college football season. Stay tuned on WTOP 10. Thank you. Thank you. save her life. You stopped smoking. Now start screening. No matter how much you smoked, early detection could save you. Talk to your doctor or learn more at savedbythescan.org. Welcome back to Stick to Sports. The first college football playoff rankings came out last Tuesday, and the committee placed the Michigan State Spartans at number three for the first time since they made the playoff in 2015. The Spartans traveled to Lafayette over the weekend and took a 40-29 upset loss against the Purdue Boilermakers. Joey, were we tricked on how good Michigan State actually is? No, Zach, in all honesty, I don't think we were. Purdue's just been playing up to teams all year. They got that win against Iowa a few weeks ago, now added Michigan State to the graveyard. But Aiden O'Connell had 536 yards three, and three touchdowns, while his number one wide receiver, David Bell, had 11 catches for 217 yards. David Bell ranked sixth in the NCAA in receiving yards, and Michigan State hasn't had a lockdown number one corner all year long. The leading receiver from opposing teams has gone over 100 yards in four of the past five games against Michigan State. And th their defense has been having troubles against a number one wideout all year long. And David Bell proved that yesterday. And Kenneth Walker's Heisman chances are probably out the window with Michigan State's playoff chances. I think we were tricked a little bit. And Michigan State had an amazing comeback win against Michigan a week ago. And we shouldn't take that away from them. But that's a rivalry game. And you know rivalry games can go either way. And especially if it's in East Lansing, 
with Michigan State being the home team. It was a great win, and Kenneth Walker is one of, if not the best running back in college football. They deserve to be in the top three for that win, but I think there are a lot of better teams than Michigan State in that college football playoff. On Saturday, the number 14 Texas A&M Aggies defeated the number 13 Auburn Tigers 20-3 at Kyle Field. Michael Clemens scored the only touchdown of the game with a 24-yard fumble return for the Aggies in the fourth quarter. Joey, a really defensive game in the SEC, but a and deserve a lot of credit for what they've done without starting quarterback Haynes King this season, right? Oh, yeah, without a doubt. I mean, whether... A&M won that game or wherever they finished this season. They beat Alabama this year. The season's a success. Isaiah Spiller was great last year for A&M. It was huge for this offense that he returned. And their defense has been outstanding all year long. Against Alabama, they, they gave up 38 points. But besides that, they haven't given up to over 26 points all year. The defense carried A&M in this win over Auburn. The, the defense has been great. They're now 7-2. and two. They've been really solid in the SEC all season long. Yeah, A&M deserves the credit they can get. This defense has an argument to be the second best in the SEC behind the Georgia Bulldogs. They've let up the second least amount of points in all of college football like you brought up. They beat Alabama earlier in the season. Jimbo Fisher has a really good team here. And they're going to get a bowl game probably. Now beating Auburn, they held them to three points. And they held running back Tank Bigsby to only 70 rushing yards, a great defensive game by Texas A&M. The number nine Wake Forest Demon Deacons were upset by the North Carolina Tar Heels in a 58 to 50, 55 shootout on Saturday. Wake Forest quarterback Sam Hartman threw for under 50% of his passes for the first time this season while throwing for 398 yards with five touchdowns and two interceptions. North Carolina's running back Ty Chandler took 22 carries for 213 yards and four touchdowns. What went wrong for Wake Forest, Joey? Well, the Wake Forest defense has been awful all year long. They've been winning shootouts all season. This is a defense that gave up 56 points to Army. Keep that in mind. The defense has been awful. Both teams gave up over 100 yards and penalties as well. Both teams left the door wide open for the other squad, but UNC had 330 yards in rushing. Wake Forest couldn't do anything in the trenches, and the secondary was exposed all day long. What went wrong for Wake Forest, we brought up a couple weeks ago, and like you said, it's the defense. And like you said again, when you give up 56 points to Army, what is going to happen when you're playing bigger and better teams, and they went on the road to a tough North Carolina team, and they lost? The New York Knicks are off to a 6-4 and four start and in sixth place in the Eastern Conference. Julius Randle currently leads the team in points, assists, and rebounds. Through the first eighth of the season, the Knicks are on the inside of the playoff picture. Zach, what have you seen from the Knicks? The Knicks' defense is awful, but it's only the first 10 games, so we can't worry too much. They have to improve a lot on the defensive side. They have a lot of time until the playoffs, but the Knicks need to find wins in the regular season, just like they did last year. In the NBA regular season, there's players resting every single night. So the Knicks, who send out the same players every single game, can win a lot of games just like they did a season ago. If they fix their defense, I think the Knicks ceiling is a second round playoff appearance. Yeah, the Knicks have been solid thus far. Julius Randle's just been doing what he does, averaging a double-double. If the Knicks want to be successful in the playoffs, they're going to need a guy around Julius Randle. But for right now, it's going to work for these New York Knicks. Evan Fournay was also a great addition. He's averaging over 15 points a game. Kemba Walker's averaging about 13 points per game as well. A couple of newcomers to these New York Knicks have been real solid. Tom Thibodeau coaches every single game to win as well. So you you got to know that early in the season, the Knicks are, go are going to be competing. And Zach, first, I mean, the, the biggest, the most important point, the bing bong video. You can't forget about that. <laughs> the Brooklyn Nets are in third place in the Eastern Conference with a 7-3 record through their first 10 games. Kevin Durant leads the squad in points and rebounds, while James Harden leads in assists. Zach, what have you seen from the Nets in their first 10 games? The Nets are having a great season so far, as they should. They're scoring just over 105 points per game and are still four games over 500. Nobody expected that. My one worry about the Nets, and it's going to hurt them in the playoffs, where are the big men? Aldridge, Griffin, 
Millsap. This would be a great team if it was six years ago. But the Brooklyn Nets now, who is going to guard Giannis Antetokounmpo? When they get to the playoffs and they have to play the Milwaukee Bucks, they have nobody there for it, and that's why they went out last year. Yeah, I mean, that's been the, the, the big knack against the Nets for, for so much time. The big men inside is definitely an issue, but the Nets are still a title favorite in my eyes, without a doubt. James Harden's going to start to get calls at some point. He's been targeted with these new rules. It's kind of being overdone in my eyes, but it'll, it'll soften up on him, without a doubt. Harden will be one of the elite scorers in the game again. Kevin Durant's in MVP form, averaging almost 29 points per game, leading the NBA. The Nets are going to be around in the postseason, without a doubt. The Philadelphia 76ers, Miami Heat, and Brooklyn Nets make up the top three teams in the East, while the Golden State Warriors, Utah Jazz, and Dallas Mavericks make up the top three teams out West. Zach, so far this season, what surprised you, and what, is, what has gone as you expected? My most surprising needs to be the Washington Wizards, a team that was barely making it into the playoffs with Russell Westbrook and Bradley Beal last year. They just beat the defending champion Milwaukee Bucks. Now they... Now, they did make a lot of changes in the offseason, but they don't have a player over 29 years old. And my least surprising is the Golden State Warriors. Stephen Curry was my MVP pick a couple of episodes ago, and he has not disappointed so far. Klay Thompson isn't healthy yet, but with Draymond, Steph, and all of those young pieces healthy, the Warriors are definitely a team to watch out for. Yeah, in my eyes, the most surprising thing without a doubt is in this Eastern side. The Hawks and the Bucks, who made the Eastern Conference Finals last year, are on the outside looking in right now. Obviously, the Bucks have had a good amount of injuries and some weird rotations to chalk it up as well. And the Hawks will obviously get back to a postseason form as well. Also, the least surprising, the Nets are in third place. They're going to be around. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, Zach will be joined by Ben Diamond. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Stick to Sports. <laughs> It takes less than one minute to find out if you may have prediabetes. You can do it here. But I get it, you're busy, and busy people can't have prediabetes. Oh, I read that wrong. They can, okay. Just go to the site. Is there a danger hiding in your home? Unused opioid medicines could harm your family. Find your unused opioid pills, patches, or syrups and learn how to dispose of them safely at fda.gov slash drug disposal. The second I got on the campus, I knew Oswego was the place to go. There's a place for everybody at Oswego. This school just opens the world to you. Have the opportunity to explore and to learn so many different things, not only about yourself, but the people around you and the world. It definitely is about the student. I felt it to be very about me. Now that I'm here, I can't imagine myself anywhere else. Stuck on the railroad crossing? Get out of your vehicle. For help, call the number on the blue and white emergency notification system sign at the crossing. Give them the crossing number to alert train traffic. Remember, find the blue and white to save your life. Welcome back to Stick to Sports. Joining me now is Ben Diamond, one of our producers. Ben, what do you have for us tonight? Thanks, Zach. After suffering a forearm strain in the start of 2020, Justin Verlander revealed he would need to get Tommy John surgery, which would keep him out of the entire 2021 season. Now that the season is over, Verlander has started working out with MLB scouts in attendance in order to either sign with a new team or re-sign with the Astros. In his bullpen, the 39-year-old right-hander was able to get up to 96 miles per hour on his fastball. If he can get back to what he was before the injury, what teams would benefit the most? Well, I'm going to knock this one out right away. 
I don't think he's going to the New York Yankees. Those reports have been out. I think there's an opportunity, though, for him to go to the New York Mets. The Mets pitching can always improve, and I think a man like Justin Verlander behind Jacob deGrom can be a very dangerous duo in New York. But in the end, I think Justin Verlander is going to stay in Houston. They lost the World Series because of pitching, in my opinion. When you don't have reliable starting pitching, you cannot win a World Series. Yeah, I agree. And I think other teams that can really benefit from the addition of Verlander, the Padres, the Mets, uh, the Astros, of course, because if they lose him, they lose a very valuable pitcher. The Dodgers, who is pretty thin with Kershaw being a free agent right now and Bauer being a question mark, as well as young Dustin May, who is out at, until at least mid-May. And I think that, that these teams can really benefit from him. Uh, over the weekend, Odell Beckham Jr. was released by the Cleveland Browns after a controversy stirred when his father posted a video about Baker Mayfield not giving his son the ball enough. The Browns ultimately decided that Beckham Jr. was no longer part of their long-term plans. Now he will have to go through a waiver period where a team is likely to pick him up, but the teams with the best bid are, are teams that are not in contention. And Beckham Jr. wants to go to a contender, but if a team out of contention picks him up, will he suck it up? or really try to force his way out? I think Odell Beckham Jr. will be a Seattle Seahawk when all of this is set and done. I don't believe he'll sign with a team that isn't a playoff contender, but the Seahawks is the best fit for him. Tyler Lockett in the slot, DK Metcalf out wide, Odell Beckham Jr. out wide on the other side. Seattle is three and five, but when you hear that Russell Wilson is coming back, and the seven seed in the NFC is the four and four Atlanta Falcons. Seattle is ready to go and Odell will boost their chances a lot. Yeah, I think even if he were to go to a bad team, I think he'd still suck it up because at the end of the season, he'll be able to sign with any team he wants. But I do agree with you. The Seahawks probably are the prime contender to get Odell Beckham Jr. And fitting him with DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett, I really don't think that there will be a better wide receiver core in the league than that one in Seattle. Throughout the summer, Ben Simmons made it known that he no longer wanted to be a part of the 76ers franchise. So the team has made efforts to grant his wish, but no teams have seemed at all interested in the player who used to be regarded as a future star. That was until recently when the Boston Celtics have seemed interested in the Philly guard. If they were to trade for Simmons, they would likely have to give up a significant haul like Jalen Brown because the 76ers still view Simmons as an asset of high value. Would a trade like this be smart for the Celtics? This would be a terrible trade for the Boston Celtics. Any team that is adding Ben Simmons needs to be prepared for his inability to score. How did the Celtics score? Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown. That's about it. Obviously, Ben Simmons brings a lot as a point guard and on the defensive side, but he isn't going to help the Boston Celtics, who are struggling right now in the Eastern Conference. I definitely 100% agree with you. I feel like this trade is not ideal whatsoever. Not only is Simmons not really played at being out of practices with the 76ers, being fined, He's not really getting the playing. He's, he's probably rusty, so he wouldn't be able to play with the Celtics for maybe a few weeks when he gets traded. And, he, and as you said, he doesn't fit any of their needs. He really just is just there to be there and not be on the 76ers anymore. I think if you're the 76ers and you can get a deal like that and get Jalen Brown, take that at any chance you get. It's going to be really interesting to see what happens with Ben Simmons. But we'll take a quick break here on Stick to Sports. Thanks once again to Ben for his segment. When we come back, Joey and I will go through our best bets and what to watch for. Don't go anywhere. You're watching Stick to Sports on WTOP 10. What would happen if, if I had to pick up the phone, call 911 for one of my family members or one of my neighbors? What would I do if, if no one was on the other end to respond? What if there was no 911? 
so you can be a part of the solution. Anybody can be a firefighter, male, female, younger, older. We are school teachers, we are leaders in business. Is me, you, anyone that wants to be. There is no typical firefighter. Here at WTOP, we pride ourselves on delivering you all the news you need to know from the day's events. Whether it's happened on Capitol Hill or right here in Oswego, we make sure you know all about it. We keep you up to date on all your favorite, all your favorite Oswego and professional sports. And our Storm Team 10 meteorologists will make sure that you know exactly what weather you're up against when you start your day. Every Monday through Thursday night, make sure to tune in to Channel 10.2. Because at WTOP, we don't just tell you the news. We are. We are. We are the news. My mother was always very familiar with her neighborhood. But one day, she stopped at the stop sign for much longer than usual. And uh, she didn't know whether she should go forward or, or turn. And she wasn't even really sure where she was at. It was very unsettling for her. I felt so much better after my son told me, Mom, I don't want you to worry or be afraid. I'll be there for you and we'll figure it out. Good dependence can happen after just five days. Know the truth, spread the truth. Welcome back to Stick to Sports. My What to Watch this week comes in next Saturday's college football slate. Purdue travels to Columbus to take on Ohio State at the Shoe at 3.30, and this is a huge game for both teams. While Purdue is not ranked nationally, they've been playing spoiler, knocking off then number two Iowa and, and number three Michigan State. Ohio State needs a win to keep their playoff hopes alive, as the Buckeyes are likely to crack into the top four in tomorrow night's CFP rankings. Will Purdue knock yet another team out of the playoff picture, or will Ohio State head into their two massive games against Michigan State and Michigan with just one loss? We'll find out Saturday at 3.30 on ABC. What a huge game we have here, and Ohio State needs to win this game. They need to win every game for the rest of the season. They got some tough ones coming up, Michigan State, and then Michigan after that. Ohio State needs to win, but Purdue can be a spoiler once again. They've knocked off Michigan State. Can they knock off Ohio State? If they do, they'll be the second team to do it in Columbus this season. But my what to watch this week is the start of the college basketball season. Tuesday night is going to be unbelievable with the Champions Classic taking place at Madison Square Garden. The doubleheader starts at 7 o'clock with the number three ranked Kansas Jayhawks taking on the unranked Michigan State Spartans. Bill Self against Tom Izzo will not disappoint as both teams look to come back from early NCAA tournament exits last season. The second game of the doubleheader is a matchup between two monster programs in college basketball as the number 10 ranked Kentucky Wildcats take on the number nine ranked Duke Blue Devils at 930. This is Duke's, Duke coach Mike Krzyzewski's final season and he wants to go all out. He's bringing in three top 25 recruits. Kentucky also did a great job in the offseason bringing in two top 25 recruits along with three four-star transfers. Finally, I'm looking at Number one, Gonzaga, they take on Dixie State on Tuesday at 9 o'clock. I cannot wait to see the dynamic duo of Chet Holmgren and Drew Timmy. College basketball is back, Joey. Poor Dixie State, Zach, being sent to the slaughterhouse. But I'm excited for that Duke game, though. Now shifting to best bets. The Cleveland Browns open as one-and-a-half point underdogs to the New England Patriots on Sunday. The Cleveland Browns have figured this thing out. Kevin Stefanski and the Cleveland Browns have figured out how to efficiently use Baker Mayfield while also not overdoing it with the QB's torn left labrum. Maybe Baker Mayfield not having to deal, deal with the pressure of not missing Odell on a play also helped his decision making, but the Browns got a huge win yesterday. The Patriots have won three straight, but that includes a win over a Jets and a half-healthy Christian McCaffrey-led Carolina Panthers. The Browns have their swagger back, and it will continue into Foxborough on Sunday. Cleveland Browns on the money line. I jump back on the winning side with the Oregon Ducks beating the Washington Huskies by more than six and a half last week. This week I'm going to the NFL where the five and four Denver Broncos host the three and six Philadelphia Eagles in an interleague matchup on Sunday. The Browns are coming off a monster upset win in Jerry's world where they tore up the Cowboys 30 to 16. The Eagles are coming off a tough home loss at the hands of the Los Angeles Chargers by a final score of 27 to 24. Jalen Hurts completed just 11 passes on Sunday, and that certainly is not going to work against a Broncos defense that forced two turnovers while letting up zero points on the first eight 
Cowboys drives. I'm looking at the Broncos in this one, minus two and a half over the Philadelphia Eagles on Sunday. That's all the time we have on this episode of Stick to Sports. Be sure to tune in next week right here on WTOP 10.